Okay, I've got it. Okay, great. So again, this is episode 37, Feeding All the Animals. As I was reading it, I couldn't figure out where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> so it surprised me as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's start with um, scene one. Okay, scene one. Hello and welcome to Notes from the Bee Yard. You're listening to episode 37, Feeding All the Animals. Because feeling confused about this episode and unsure about where it's going is such a big part of what makes it fun to listen to, I'm not going to tell you what it's about. Simply know that it was a joy to work on this one, and I hope that some of that shines through. My name is Laura Tyler. I'm your producer and host. This is episode 37, Feeding All the Animals, written by Tom Theobald in 1991 and read by Tom in 2021. Animals define a large part of the environment on almost any farm. They provide wool and hides, meat and milk, eggs and anecdotes. And seeing that they have feed and water structures much of the day. Over the years, we have tried a variety of animals. Some have remained to become a part of the living environment around our place while others have passed along after a time to be remembered fondly or otherwise as interesting experiences. The last of the queens from the second shipment went into the colonies yesterday morning under a threatening sky. It is always a relief to reach this point in the season, the end of the first big push but the relief is more psychological than real, and after a pause of about 15 seconds, I'll continue my rounds of the bee yards, checking for acceptance of the new queens. For now, though, I can pause on a quiet Sunday morning in the garden with a paper and a cup of coffee. The Canada red cherry, planted in delicately in a crack in the concrete, by birds which had gorged on the fruit of the neighbor's tree, casts a cooling shadow across my chair. Most of the animals have been fed, the chickens, doves, and pigeons. The ever-insistent cat Tigger, who nags as only cats can. The scent of lilac drifts through the air, as a pair of nest-building morning doves call plaintively, from the Chinese elm. Our own ringneck does attempt to answer, but I doubt that there is any communication going on. The hulk laboriously flaps his bulk to the top of the garbage can, which holds the scratch, bats his wings against his sides, and hurls challenges and insults over to the roosters at Halyebecks and Tannenbaums a quarter mile away. As I languish briefly in the garden, in my morning reverie, the most demanding animal of all awaits me in the house. Like some reptiles, this critter feeds infrequently, and Sunday is the day. A favorite of many of my friends, it holds a strange appeal for me as well and yet I often find it intimidating, threatening, even dangerous. It calls me silently from across the distance, whether I am here at home or far off in a bee yard somewhere, and as I enter the room and close the door, we face each other quietly before the feeding ritual begins. It is subject to wide personality swings sometimes sitting there sullen and uncommunicative, at other times chatty 
rarely even eloquent. Small but voracious, its food does not come from bags or bales or cans, and while I have fed it without fear, it can sometimes come back long after to bite me. This house pet sits upon my desk, tethered by a cord to an outlet in the wall. Its diet consists of words, the product of my mind, flowing from my fingers, and it promptly spits its food upon the page to be examined. For this animal is my typewriter, and its product is the column. Tom, I wasn't sure where this one was going. I wasn't either. <laughs> I thought, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> Did, I never had a lizard. <laughs> I was picturing some feral dog or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. When did it dawn on you what this was about? Oh, it wasn't until the last two or three sentences. <laughs> Paragraphs. <laughs> so what do you want to say about this? The typewriter and now the computer are monsters. <laughs> where you pour your brains upon the page, hoping that uh, you don't sound too ridiculous, sometimes maybe even uh, articulate. Hmm. But they are monsters. What do you mean? How many thoughts does the average person have during the course of the day that they don't have to share with anyone? Right. If you're a writer, it's wholly different. You reveal what's in your mind to the world at large. And uh, try not to look too much like a fool. Try to look like your uh, your thoughts have some coherence. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like, having a weekly column in the local paper that was kind of like a diary? I obviously had things I wanted to share with people in the best way that I could. Mm -hmm. And I think it fortunately worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. I didn't stumble too much. I had things that I thought were interesting that I wanted to share with the public, and I think it worked, worked out pretty well. Time went on, I became better and better at doing it. So it sounds like some columns went better than others, or that I'm kind of interested to hear what some of the not-so-great or the harder experiences were like. Maybe columns that you weren't happy with or that got some pushback. We'll come across those as we continue to read these. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but uh, we'll undoubtedly come across some that were not so good. How do you define what is good or what's not? How do you know? Only the writer knows. Well, I'm interested in these questions because there are a lot of people who may be listening who might be interested in writing their own stories. I think the only answer to that is you come to the edge with the typewriter in hand and you jump. <laughs> what does that mean? What does it mean? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what writing means? What it means to the writer or it means to the reader or the listener. Who knows what that means? That's the great mystery of life. Hmm. You hope to do it as well as you can in a way that is appreciated by people, but who knows how you do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand that this was a huge commitment, writing a weekly column. That's a, There's some time pressure there. And I'm kind of interested to hear how you felt about that when you added it to your routine and then what 
Yeah, so we'll talk about this in a couple different chunks. What was There's it? an interesting story to the writing and its early ev- evolution that we should talk about. Okay. We don't have to do it now, but we should talk about yes, it. Yes, we have to do it now. Well, when I first decided that I was going to write, we had just started the edition on the house. So I dug up my... 1963 Olympia typewriter. When I was in high school, in the first two or three years I was in college, I did not have a typewriter. So I'd get up on Sunday morning long before Barbara, and I'd start banging out a column, and banging is the operative word here. (laughs) (laughs) This was not the, this was a manual typewriter. It wasn't long before Barbara presented me with a present of an actual good typewriter. And so then I progressed to that. Mm -hmm. In the early years of the column, it was uh, me banging away on a typewriter in the quiet of a Sunday morning while Barbara was trying to sleep. And uh, that was how it evolved. So how did you pick Sunday morning as your writing day? That was the time that I had free, that it was quiet, I could think, and uh, I wasn't bothering anyone but Barbara. I think that it's maybe easy enough to write two or three columns Maybe four, and then you get to a point where you really have to dig a little deeper, and that's actually when it gets very interesting, right? Maybe at heart I was a writer, and I always had these thoughts that when something happened or I saw something happen or something popped into my mind, I would think, boy, that would be a good column. That would make an interesting story. Mm-hmm. I still I still have those thoughts, even though it's been quite a few years since I've written. That's why the conversations that we have after people have listened to the column are interesting to me because I can reflect back on the time when I did the column and share new thoughts with you and with the listeners. Mm-hmm. Today we're doing the recording. It's October 15th, and we just released a new episode. It's Backroads to Meeker. And for those of you who haven't listened to this one yet, it's a little bit poignant. It's about a road trip, and um, there's some memories about dogs, um, people who've passed. And so it's a little bit sad. And um, I just wanted to check in with you and see what it's like listening to that now. For me, it's uh, both sad and very rewarding. I remember pretty specifically writing that column, and I remember the dogs that I referred to as very close friends, very close parts of the family. I have a journal where I I made occasional notations about what I was doing, and I probably gave that up about the time I started beekeeping. And the reason I gave it up is because it was boring. It's like talking to yourself. Um, The last entry that I can recall I made on uh, one of the... Trout Rivers in uh, Montana, the big hole. And uh, I kept track of the water temperature and things like that, but I drifted away from keeping a journal. So maybe the uh, articles in the fence post, which came several years after, were the substitute for a journal. Can you describe this monster? that this essay is about? 
The monster was what uh, connected me with my audience. And I call it a monster facetiously. Uh, typing is a challenge for me because I never completed a typing class in high school, and most of my friends have heard that story. Barbara had uh, finished her typing class the first semester of our senior year, and so it was offered again for those who didn't get it in the fall. I opted instead to take a study period rather than take the typing class so that I could pursue Barbara. Well, here I am. <laughs> I'm a writer. I had Barbara in most of my life. My typing is, is challenged, but I think it was a wise choice mm -hmm. in terms of the quality of my life. Yeah. I'm kind of interested to know what you have enjoyed reading throughout your life as a boy, as an adult. I started, I, in fact, I still have the, uh, a series of books by Thornton Burgess, Nature Stories. And there were a whole series of characters, uh, Little Joe Otter, uh, Sammy J. There were a whole series, and I still have those books that were given to me as a child, and they're probably the first books that I read as a child. I still have oh, them. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Whitefoot the Wood Mouse yep. was one of my favorites. Yep. So it sounds like this love of nature was really nurtured as a child by this place that you grew up in, Wisconsin, and then these beautiful books. Yes. There's some combination in there yeah. that led to my attitudes as an adult or a young adult. So anything else about your career as a writer that you want to share with our listeners at this point in the podcast? I think we beat this one to death, haven't we? <laughs> Maybe. I feel like you have actually more to say about this and that I just haven't gotten it out of you yet. <laughs> well, we have a long time for you to get it out of me. Thank you for listening to Notes from the Yard. We'll be back in two weeks with episode 38. In the meantime, if you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with your friends. You can hop on over to notesfromthebr.buzz, find our Facebook group, and subscribe.